Good afternoon and welcome. My name is Hank Clark. I'm program director of the Political Economy Project, and it's a great pleasure indeed to welcome all of you to the PEP's very first public event of spring 2021. Uh, do check out our website for information on our full lineup of public events uh, in the spring term or join our mailing list at the www.pep.dartmouth.edu for timely notification on all PEP activities. Now, our guest today is Virginia Postrel. Uh, it's a great joy to welcome Virginia here, longtime editor of Reason Magazine, widely read columnist, I'm sure many of you know, for the New York Times, The Atlantic, Forbes, and recently for Bloomberg Opinion. Uh, her books include The Power of Glamour, The Substance of Style, and the 1998 work, The Future and Its Enemies, which I recommend to people on the street uh, uh, that I encounter by chance whenever I have an opportunity to do so. Uh, her work has received many awards and recognitions from the Los Angeles and Dallas Press Clubs, the Bastia Society, and others. And she's here today, of course, to discuss her most recent book, The Fabric of Civilization, a wonderful sort of world history of textiles. And on that note, I would uh, observe that she is on the board of the Southern California Hand Weavers Guild. So it's a real joy to have her with us this afternoon. Our format will be very simple. Virginia will speak for a while. And if you have questions as she goes along, uh, please uh, make a mental note or uh, jot down a note uh, and, and then use the raising hands tab at the bottom of your Zoom screen so that we can keep track. And I'll try and call on a few students to begin, but everyone present is welcome to participate and we'll take as many questions as we have time for. Without further ado, uh, Virginia, thanks so much for being with us this afternoon. Uh, welcome to Dartmouth College and take it away, ma'am. My pleasure. Okay, I'm going to share my screen. So, uh, as Hank suggested when he described this as a, a world history, which it is, uh, this book covers a lot of territory. Um, and in order to do that, I had to come up with a very tight focus, a uh, very tight outline for the book. And I'm going to try to give you a sense of that in this talk. Uh, the first thing I'm going to do is show a video. Oh, wait a minute. I have to make sure that I have my screen sharing properly done. Uh, this is, uh, sh yeah, so we can share the sound as well as the. Okay, uh, so the first thing I'm going to do is show a video that's kind of an overview of the book, and then I'm going to go through and pick out some examples from uh, the various uh, chapters. So let's start with this. I'm Virginia Postrel, the author of The Fabric of Civilization. My book is about one of humanity's most important and influential technologies, textiles. The word textiles comes from the Indo-European root tex, which means to weave. It's the same root that gives us the word technology. Textiles are such an old technology that we rarely think about them. They hide in plain sight. From the moment we are born, we are surrounded by cloth. We sleep among textiles, walk on them, wash, and dry with them. Textiles protect us from the elements. They carry our stuff. They help us celebrate. Textiles are everywhere. Textiles go to war. <laughs> 
it keep us safe? And bandage wounds. They provide comfort and joy. The story of textiles is older than history. And younger than tomorrow. It stretches back to cave dwellers twisting plant fibers into string and forward to scientists embedding threads with computer chips. It is the story of human ingenuity in all its manifestations, artistic and technical, economic and cultural. The pursuit of cloth gave us germ theory. It led to the belt drive and the chemical industry. It built factories and finance. Textile traders spread the alphabet and Arabic numbers, literacy and bookkeeping. They funded the Italian Renaissance and the Mughal Empire, the David and the Taj Mahal. The story of textiles is a story of commerce and culture, a story of peaceful trade and savage wars. The story of textiles is a human story. It's a story made by women and by men, by famous leaders and forgotten peasants. It's a story of art and science, of economics and religion. It's a global story set in every time and place. It is humanity's story. It is our story. Please join me in exploring the fabric of civilization, how textiles made the world. So I start, the outline of the book is to trace the story of textiles, not chronologically, but in terms of a textile from fiber to thread, to cloth, to dye, and then out into the marketplace with traders and consumers. And then finally, there's a chapter that looks at some of the developments that start with the development of nylon and go to work that people are doing today. It's called Innovators. I'm actually not going to talk about that one today. And each chapter has a warp and a weft. It has the warp of that, of that stage, and it has the weft of a theme. So we start with fiber, and the theme that I develop there and that I think is very important is that although we talk about so-called natural fibers, none of the fibers that we use are natural. Uh, they are all human artifacts. And let's talk about the, the one that is the most common, most popular natural fiber, and that is cotton. Now, we all have an idea of what cotton looks like, big fluffy white bowls, uh, fields of white, uh, about waist high. This is not natural. None of this is natural. Uh, this is not what cotton looks like in the wild. It's not what cotton would look like without human intervention. In the wild, hum uh, cotton looks more like this. This is a photo that I took looking up at the products of a cotton tree. And I was struck by this little thread hanging down because looking up at that, I could imagine how ancient people would have said, hey, I could do something useful with that. I could turn it into string. I could turn it into a useful tool. Now, this tree I saw in the greenhouse on the top of uh, the building at Iowa State University where this fellow Jonathan Wendell works. He's an expert on cotton genetics. And one thing I learned from him is that there are roughly 50 species of cotton in the world. And most of those species have no more fiber than a peach. 
Uh, most of them, they have pretty flowers, look kind of like hibiscus, but they didn't produce fiber. Uh, the mutation that produced fiber took place only once. It took place somewhere in Africa, and the uh, descendant of that plant, the direct descendant, looks something like this. And you can tell by the tiny flowers how small the, the cotton bowls would be from that. And through some freak accidents of nature, uh, this uh, genetic mutation in Africa uh, actually managed to spread to the New World as well, uh, long before humans came along. And when humans came along, they cultivated and created four domesticated species of cotton. Two in the old world, one in Africa, and I'm always embarrassed to say Africa because it's so big. We think it's probably around where Uganda is, but it's not exactly known. Uh, one in the Indus Valley uh, and two in the Americas, one in the Yucatan Peninsula and the other in Peru. And the, under human ingenuity, as a product of human ingenuity and cultivation, these wild species went from looking something like this. This is the Gisipian hirsutum, which is the Yucatan version, which accounts today for about 90 of the world, 90 percent of the world's cotton. It went from looking something like this to looking like this. This is Gisipian barbadense, which is the Peruvian version. It's sometimes called Sea Island cotton or Pima cotton, uh, sometimes incorrectly called uh, Egyptian cotton. It's a long fibered cotton. And it went from looking something like this to something like this. And this is one of the old world cottons, the dominant uh, species, which was eventually mostly supplanted by the new world cotton. So this is about 10% of the market today. This is about 90%, and this is in the noise. But you can see that cotton, which we think of today as a natural fiber in compared to, say, polyester, which is a synthetic fiber designed in a lab, it is a human artifact. It was made by human beings uh, who took something that existed in the biological world and altered it in order to get something they could use, originally for making small amounts of string and eventually for making large amounts of thread, which brings us to the second stage. Now, as you can see, the fibers in cotton, and the same would be true of wool or, or linen, are not very long. They they are just a little, they're just little bits of, of, of fiber. And to make anything useful, to make thread, and certainly to make enough thread or yarn to weave or knit, make cloth with, you need to do something to those fibers. You need to twist them together so that they become stronger and longer. And that requires spinning. Spinning is a very ancient technology that was developed around the world, and most spinning in most places uh, was very simple. It, it was essentially what you see here on this Greek vase. You had a stick, and it had a weight on one end or the other. Depending on where you were, the weight might be wood, it might be metal, it was more, most often clay or stone. And what you did was you fed the fiber onto this and you set the, the spindle spinning like a top and the weight keeps that angular momentum going. You could feed the fiber onto it, twist it and stretch it out and eventually then wrap it as, as you develop string, you'd wrap it around here. And then later on, many, many centuries later, about 2,500 years ago, someone in China figured out that, hey, if you turn this wheel on its side and connect it to a larger wheel with a, a string, you can turn the big wheel once and get a lot of rotations of the small wheel. And this developed what was called the spindle wheel, which was a faster way of spinning. And then in Europe in the 15th century, a third uh, invention was added, which sort of took up the, the finished string and you got what is known as the spinning wheel. But the important fact about spinning 
is that it is extremely time consuming, which when you see it done, you don't really realize. So yeah, I'm going to show a video here of two forms of spinning. The first is an Andean spinner uh, who is spinning alpaca. It's held under her arm, and she is using a traditional drop spindle. The second is a Laotian woman who is spinning cotton, and she is using a spindle wheel. And when you see it, it looks like magic. It looks incredibly fast, it, and you can see why spinning in many forms of mythology came to represent birth or the creation of order out of chaos, because that really what it's doing. You have these fibers that are in no order whatsoever, and you produce this string out of it. But it is very time-consuming to produce the amounts of thread you need to make anything because fabric contains enormous amounts of thread. Uh, the Spinning the thread for one Viking sail took more than a year, the equivalent of 385 eight-hour days. And if you look at the sail as a whole, that is not just the spinning, but plucking the sheep, cleaning the wool, spinning the wool, weaving the wool, sewing the panels of wool together, that took longer to create than the ship. And it's not as though they were using power tools to make these ships. So it gives you some idea of how valuable cloth was. It took, it takes about six miles of thread, of cotton yarn, to weave the denim in a pair of jeans. And using the fastest pre-industrial revolution form of spinning, which was the Indian charka, which is a, a spindle wheel, and those spinners were very, very good also, it would take about 100 hours to do that. Using earlier technologies, much, much more. So you're talking about, let's say, two weeks to spin enough thread to weave a single pair, uh, the fabric for a single pair of trousers. One pair. And when you start to think about sails and army tents and blankets and anything that you might need, you see why fiber was, uh, why fabric was so precious in ways we can barely understand today because it is so abundant. And spinning was the, the bottleneck in the production of cloth, at, at least at the, uh, on the eve of the Industrial Revolution. Weavers would sometimes be sitting around twiddling their thumbs, unable to work because they couldn't get enough yarn to make their cloth with. It took about 20 spinners to supply one loom or more, sometimes 20 to 30. So here you are in the late 18th century with this incredibly time-consuming process that makes fabric incredibly precious, even though spinners are paid very poorly because it takes them so long to produce anything useful. Uh, and along come spinning machines because everybody realizes that this would be a very useful technology. And they change the world. The Industrial Revolution starts with the spinning of thread. And you can see when you understand the economics of the, the, the low productivity of traditional spinning, you can understand why this has such ripple effects. Because it not only reduces the cost and increases the abundance of thread, it increases the abundance of everything made with textiles. And that includes not only uh, clothing, not only household articles like, like bed linens or, um, well, I would say sofa cushions today, but, you know, chair cushions, various kinds of pillows, but also sails, also sacks for transporting things, various kinds of belts, um, various kinds of, of tents and, and that sort of thing. It ripples throughout the economy and it has an enormous effect. So we go from thread to cloth from 
one dimension to two dimensions produced by thinking in three dimensions. The theme of my cloth chapter is that cloth is embodied code. Cloth is fundamentally mathematical in the same way that music is fundamentally mathematical. The existence of cloth is evidence of mathematics at work in the tangible world. And mathematics has been described as the science of patterns. And you really see this when you look at the mathematics of textiles. One pattern that is very important in the textiles, for example, is symmetry. How do you remember how to produce a traditional pattern like this one, which is an Andean, uh, a Peruvian weaver? Well, you remember it by remembering the symmetries. These outside, oops, these outside stripes are actually what you do to create the inside stripe is you use this one and its mirror image. So these two are the mirror images, combine them and you get that. And this is how Andean weavers create patterns, reproduce patterns, vary patterns. It's by understanding and playing with symmetry, which is a fundamentally mathematical concept. And fundamentally mathematical concepts are throughout weaving. But the one that we think of most today is that weaving is intrinsically binary. You are either going over a thread or under a thread. You are lifting a thread or lowering a thread. It is one zero on off a binary, uh, a binary process that human beings have been playing with, remembering patterns in for thousands and thousands of years. And the one thing, of course, that people know about this binary process is that Monsieur Jacquard came along and he figured out how to use punch cards to co encode uh, the very complicated patterns in weaving. Uh, these were patterns that were done previously by an extremely laborious process called a draw loom. Uh, they were hard to store. And he, uh, because they involve raising not just, as we saw here, a bunch of threads at once uh, in, a, in, in a unique, uh, in a repeating pattern, but unique patterns each line. This is a, this is a woven portrait that used 20,000 of these cards. Each card represents one line of thread. And it, the card tells you which warp threads to raise. Uh, if there is a hole, you don't raise it. If there is not a hole, you do raise it. It's an intrinsically binary process. And it was a great inspiration to, of course, Char to Charles Babbage, who was the sort of father of thinking about computers, although in his case, they were pretty much theoretical. And then later in the 20th century to actual uh, computer scientists. In fact, before the invention of silicon chips in the 1970s, computer memory was stored in a woven form. Uh, this is what is called magnetic core memory. Uh, you have essentially a woven fabric of uh, metal, uh, of copper wires. You have the warp and the weft. And then at each intersection, you have a little uh, magnetic donut. And you have uh, uh, diagonal threads as well that can send an electric pulse to a specific intersection and that can change the uh, the charge on the on the donut to positive or negative a one or a zero and this is how computer programs were stored this was the uh, the random access memory uh, of the uh, 1960s for example and the people who developed, uh, magnetic core memory were not, they were not weavers and they were not thinking about weaving, but they created a woven structure because weaving is intrinsically binary and they were solving a problem of binary mathematics. So we go, we've got our cloth. We've got all the function you need. You do not need dye to have functional fabrics. And yet 
people have been dyeing cloth for at least 6,200 years. This is a, a bit of indigo dyed textile that was found in an area of Peru that is very dry and is one of the few places on earth where you can find really, really old archeological textiles. And what's fascinating about this is that 6,200 years ago, people were pretty much living a subsistence life. And yet they went to a great deal of trouble to not only dye their cloth, but to make stripes. And this actually uses three different colors. This is the computer recreation of, of what the pattern is. It uses the natural sort of beige color that comes off the cotton plant in that period. It uses indigo to dye blue stripes, and it uses a milkweed plant to get these very bright, what would have been at the time, very bright white uh, bits of, of into the pattern. So dye shows us that human beings value textiles not only for their functional purposes, which are many and are very important, but also for their beauty and for their meanings. And those meanings can revolve around status. Uh, they can be uh, signs of ethnic identity, of uh, gender, of religious uh, devotion, M many different forms. They can just be, you know, <laughs> Uh, sports teams, uh, any uh, color can take on many different meanings. And people have been working very hard to create colors and cloth for many thousands of years. And it's quite remarkable. The history of dye show, is essentially the history of chemistry. And it shows how far you can get just doing trial and error experimentation without a fundamental understanding of what's going on at the, you know, in the scientific sense. Uh, and the answer is you can get very, very far. So indigo is the oldest dye we, we found. And the guy who worked on it, Jeffrey Splitstover, has a very important point. He says, in the modern world, we sometimes think of ancient people as primitive with a lack of understanding about the world, but really you had to be pretty smart to live back then. You had to be smart to figure out how to die with indigo. You had to be able to figure out things that you didn't really understand by trial and error because there is a lack of understanding. Ancient people did have a lack of understanding about the world. They didn't know as much about the fundamentals as we know. But the reason we know those things is because we live after them, because we inherit all the, ben all the benefits of many thousands of years uh, of experimentation and discovery about the world and specifically about dyes. So what is remarkable about indigo is that all around the world, people figured out how to make it. They uh, it they use different plants, different plants because uh, that aren't even necessarily related to each other. But people, whoa, what happened? This is not people. This is in Indonesia. I think my slides are. Oh, that got out of place. So indigo is a very complicated process. Uh, you start with a vat that uh, looks sort of like this. It has kind of a blue foam on the side on the top, but it is. The, the actual dye is sort of green looking. Excuse me, my phone, which should be silenced, is you dip your cloth in it. The cloth turns a greenish color. And then you put it in the sun and voila, it turns blue. And what's going on to a chemist is this. You have a, a chemical in the plants. You also have enzymes in the plants. When you put it in the water, it turns into this. You add oxygen and it turns into this. This is your blue color. But there's a problem. That blue color falls down to the bottom of the vat. Uh, it, you could use it as a pigment. You could use it to paint with, essentially. But you can't use it to dye cloth. To get it to dye cloth, you have to change it into something else and then change that into something else. And then eventually you can put your cloth in it, then... 
take your cloth out, expose it to the air, and you get blue cloth. Now, obviously, 6,200 years ago, people didn't understand this. This is a very recent uh, analysis. But all around the world, people figured out how to dye with indigo. They figured it out in, in India, hence the name. They figured it out in Japan. They figured it out in West Africa. And in Europe, they used a, a, a plant called woad. Until the 16th century, dyeing was, it was not only was it like cooking, that is, it was done by trial and error. It was like cooking without cookbooks. You learned to cook from your mother, but you didn't ever have a cookbook. The same was true for dyers. You learned uh, as an apprentice or as, as a child in a family of dyers, but nobody wrote it down because it was secret. You didn't want anybody to know your dyeing secrets. But in the 16th century, you start to have an idea abroad in Europe that people should share knowledge, that it would be better if these things were not secrets, that dyeing and other uh, arts and crafts and sciences could advance more if the knowledge were shared. And the first dye manual then comes in 1548. It's called the Plicto. And the idea is an Italian guy. I suspect he started this as a business proposition, although he says it was idealistic. But I don't think he probably made any money because it took him about 12 years to pry all these dye recipes out of Italian dyers. But this was the first dyeing manual. And it is part of the ferment in that starts early as early as the 16th century, but really grows in the 17th and 18th century, where people start to think about science as a shared activity and in a more systematic way. What can we figure out by systematically doing trial and error as opposed to sort of less systematically doing trial and error? And it takes a long time, but dying is one of the things that people who are interested in this new science called chemistry are very much focused on. And particularly in France, uh, where the government uh, is owns essentially a, a dye workshop. Uh, the best job for science in Europe, uh, some, some thought, was to be what was called the inspector of the dye works in France. And that wasn't, it wasn't really the guy with a clipboard and, and a checklist that that suggests. It was the, the head scientists studying dyes and you got you know got funding and you got to experiment and write uh, but even then people didn't really understand what was going on it's only with the uh, the development of of also in France this is Lavoisier of the a, a more fundamental understanding of chemical uh, what's going on with chemistry and the publication of his elements the idea of the idea of elements, the idea of oxidation, that you start to get some inkling of what might be going on with something like indigo. What is going on with all those transformations? People really try hard to use this new science to apply to dyes because dyes are incredibly important economically. But it's only in the 19th century where it really pays off. And it starts with this guy, William Perkin, only he didn't look anything like this when he made his great discovery in 1856. He was actually a teenager. He was about 18. Uh, some sources say 19, but I think it's 18. Uh, and he was on his Easter vacation at home from studying chemistry in London, and he, he was really into it. He had a lab in his house, at his parents' house, and he was trying to create a very important uh, anti-malarial drug called uh, quinine using some of the waste products uh, of producing coal gas for lighting. So, so he was using these sort of this chemical sludge called coal tar as a feedstock and he was trying to develop this drug. And his experiment was a complete flop, uh, but he kept fooling around with it and developed a, uh, he, he tried dissolving this sort of black precipitate that he got in alcohol, and it turned a beautiful purple. So in 1856 in Great Britain, the textile industry was huge. It was 
as prominent as you know, IT today or something. So he thinks, hey, you know, this could be a die. This could be a die and I could start a company and I can make a lot of money. So he does a little research and sure enough, he's told, yeah, if you could turn this into a dye, there would be a huge market for it. It's even fashionable, this purple color. And like many entrepreneurs that I have interviewed over the course of my career, if he'd had any idea how hard it was going to be, he never would have done it because it was incredibly hard. Essentially, to go from that lab bench to industrial quantities, he had to invent the chemical industry. He had to invent all kinds of machines and apparatuses, not only to make the dye, but to make the feedstocks to make the dye. But within a few years, he had cracked the problem and his new dye, which came to be called Mauve, was incredibly successful. It inspired many other entrepreneurs in, in England, uh, in Germany, and in the United States in particular, to start dye works. And they became the source of the chemical industry. Now, when we say the chemical industry today, it kind of has a bad reputation, but that's partly because we live in the world that it created. So for example, Bayer aspirin, Bayer started as a dye works. All kinds of medicines came out of the chemical industry. Uh, all kinds of adhesives and glues, uh, photographic chemicals, explosives, uh, uh, paint, new forms of paints, uh, any, if you look around your, uh, your surroundings, many, many of the things that you will see came out of that chemical industry and it started with dyes. And in a sense, this book also started with dyes because one of the inspirations was seeing this dress in an exhibit at the Museum of the Fi Fashion Institute of Technology in New York many years ago, at least 10, maybe 15 years ago. And when I saw this vivid purple and this vivid black, I understood why aniline dyes were such a revelation, why they caught on so fast. These synthetic dyes created colors and created them for the masses that people had not experienced in the past. And they were a huge hit with many ripple effects. And then finally, in 1880, this fellow, not related uh, to Bayer aspirin, created synthesis he synthesized indigo so that it no longer had to be grown uh, as a plant and processed in complicated ways and now we live in a world where people design machines to take it off of our clothes so all of this effort you've got your textiles now what do you do with them and one of the things you do is you trade and one of the things that is very striking about the history of textiles and why it serves very well as a world history is that it is one of the oldest traded things, fabric. If you go back 4,000 years, we have these amazing records, the cuneiform tablets that about tens of thousands of these cuneiform tablets that are the records of expatriate traders in a, a town called Kanesh, which is in Anatolia here. They were from a town called Assur, which is near where Mosul is in Iraq today. And this is uh, Cecile Michel, who translated a lot of these uh, tablets. And these records are their, their letters, their contracts, they are uh, debt records and their payments. Uh, they're our oldest records of long distance trade, much of which was in textiles. And they are very charming in their humanity. Uh, we have, for example, uh, letters between a wife in Kanesh and her husband slash business partner, a wife in Asur and her husband slash business partner in Kanesh. She's the person who's in charge of making the cloth and he's the guy selling the cloth and she's writing to him, telling her him what cloth she's sent to him and who's going to bring it. 
And she also is complaining. She's complaining that he's complaining. She's complaining that he's saying the cloth isn't good enough. And she's saying, hey, I do, I do what you tell me to do and this cloth is great. And it's not only this wonderful little picture of a husband and wife's tensions, but also of a a classic business partner tension between the person in production manufacturing and the person in sales and the person in sales says why don't you make what i sell and she says why don't you sell what i make oh and, and it's it's one of the great things about studying history and particularly i think about studying textile history is it relates your experience and and our contemporary experience to the experience of people who are completely different from us in every way you can imagine and yet there's something very similar and one of those things is the use of cloth so this kind of mass literacy where you have not only a trader able to write, but also his wife able to write her own letters starts with textile trade. Another thing that, as mentioned in the video, that starts with a textile trade, in, this is in Renaissance Italy, is the spread of Hindu Arabic numbers into Europe. Uh, the people who really had use for the, these newfangled ideas of, of calculating with the zero and with these individual digits rather than with Roman numerals and an abacus, the people who could really use this were textile merchants. And they not only adopted this sort of new technology, if you will, they started schools to, or they funded schools to teach their kids how to do it. And so people, including Niccolo Machiavelli, went to uh, these, these arithmetic schools where they learned how to do all kinds of word problems, most of which involve textiles. And they learned all those techniques and some other ones that have gone, all those techniques you learn in elementary school, how to add, subtract, multiply, and divide. Somebody had to invent those things and somebody had to teach them for the first time. And a major driver of that was textiles. So all of this effort, all of this effort from growing fiber to spinning it, to weaving or knitting it, to dyeing it, to, to trading it and all of the apparatuses of finance and, and uh, record keeping and all that, that, that draw, grow up around that, all of this exists for one reason. And that reason is that people want cloth. It's all about ultimately what the consumers want. And the theme of my chapter on consumers wound up being that people want what they want and they will go to extreme lengths to get it. And uh, that can mean uh, defying laws. It can mean invading other countries. Uh, it, it, consumers are disruptive, they are powerful and they are defiant. And I want to end with a video about one such example. To introduce this video, I've come to Hollywood, to this Cannabis Before Prohibition mural. It's appropriate because this is a story of prohibition, of what my shirt and my bandana have in common with marijuana and marijuana dispensaries. Our story starts in the 1600s around the time that British colonists were settling what would become the first United States of America. Back then, if you were European, all the textiles in your life, your clothes, your bed covers, your curtains, your cushions, your tablecloths, whatever, were probably solid colors with maybe a few stripes, plaids, or checks thrown in. If you were rich, you could embroider them with silk thread. If you were very rich, you could buy brocades with patterns like flowers or pomegranates woven in through a laborious and very expensive process. But if you just wanted a floral summer dress, you were out of luck. In the 17th century, that changed. Merchants began bringing in cotton prints from India. They were amazing. The cloth itself was super soft, woven of incredibly finely spun threads. It was cool in the summer, it was easy to wash and dry, and it made great underwear, much better than linen. And then there were the colors, reds and blues, purples and pinks, greens, yellows, and browns, 
they were gorgeous. And unlike the dyes Europeans were used to, they didn't fade in the wash. Europeans went crazy for calico. They turned the exotic prints into wall hangings and bed covers. They made them into ladies' dresses and gentlemen's robes for lounging at home. They turned them into easily laundered baby clothes. Everybody loved calico. Everybody, that is, except the silk industry and the wool industry and linen and hemp. They were aghast. They demanded protection from the calico competition. Save our jobs, they told their governments. And in many places, the governments listened. Some taxed the imported fabrics. Others banned them altogether. France went in for prohibition supersize. It banned calico imports, but it didn't stop there. It banned all cotton imports, even of plain fabric with no design on it whatsoever. And it banned all prints, even prints made in France by French companies using French made cloth. France's prohibition was not just anti-foreign. It was anti-cotton and anti-print. The silk industry was running the show. For 73 years, from 1686 to 1759, France treated calico essentially the way the United States treats cocaine. But the prohibition never worked. The demand was insatiable. If you were willing to take the risk, there was big money to be made in the calico trade. Smugglers brought in the forbidden cloth from countries like Switzerland and Holland where it was legal. Or they got it from the French East India Company by lying about their intentions. They claimed they were going to take it to Africa to trade for slaves, which was okay with the French government. And then they'd turn around and sell it in France or its colonies, which was definitely not okay. The French government kept ratcheting up the penalties. Traffickers could be sentenced to years pulling oars in the Navy's galleys. The worst offenders were put to death. Ordinary people caught wearing calico could be arrested and imprisoned without trial. During a crackdown in 1730, a young Parisian was caught standing in the doorway of the wine shop where she worked. She was arrested for wearing a jacket with red flowers. Another woman was on her way to the butchers when she was busted. Her crime, a jacket with brown flowers and red stripes. The fashion police peeked into windows. They saw people wearing calico in the privacy of their own homes and hauled them off to jail. But the French refused to give up their calicos. Aristocrats even wore them to the court of Versailles. Madame de Pompadour, King Louis XV's mistress, loved them. Calico prohibition turned countless French citizens into criminals. Enlightenment thinkers began to argue that the ban was not merely ineffectual, but unjust. One asked, will our descendants be able to believe that our nation was truly as enlightened and civilized as we now like to say, when they read that in the middle of the 18th century, a man in France was hanged for buying in Geneva at 22 sous what he was able to sell in Grenoble for 58? Prohibition was lifted in 1759 and replaced with a 25% tax on imported calicos. Finally free to buy cotton cloth from India, French entrepreneurs developed their own printing technology using copper plates. A new industry was born. Inspired by Chinese porcelain, they created the patterns we now call toile, like this t-shirt. So the next time you put on a flowered dress or a Hawaiian shirt, or buy printed pillowcases for your bed, or a printed face mask to keep from spreading your germs. Remember the ingenious Indians who gave us calicos and the defiant French who broke the law to wear them. All right. So, thank you very much. And thank you very much too, Virginia, for a really fascinating talk.
uh, if you'll take some questions. Uh, uh, those of you who would like to ask questions uh, of Virginia, please just use the raise hand uh, feature on your Zoom monitor and we'll take you in the order that uh, you appear. And let's see him. Uh, John Wellborn, you're first. Uh, hold on a second. I have to allow you to talk, and I'm about to do that. Great. Can you hear me? Yes, indeed. Wonderful. Thank you for a fascinating talk, Virginia. Thank you for visiting with us. I'm here with my students from a class where we discussed the political economy of regulation. And of uh -huh. course, regulation is intimately tied up with trade and manufacture of cloths. And I wonder if you could speak a little bit about regulation and standardization in fabrics. There are a lot of examples, but one that comes to mind is, of course, fire safety and fire retardants, which is a constant source of uh, give and take. We, we develop fabrics right. and materials that are fire resistant, but it turns out that they're actually quite toxic. And so we have to roll back. We have to change things. Um, that's my question. Thank you. OK, well, it is true there there are uh, not just the history of, you know, I, I think the content regulation is an interesting um, aspect of of the it, when you get into textile history, like deep textile far long ago, um, because there has always been an issue about trying to police fraud. Uh, one of the things that people would do, for example, is they would make the, if you had a bolt of cloth, they would weave the, the front part of the bolt of cloth, the part that you could see when you were shopping for it, uh, really tightly and well, and the later parts poorly. And one of the things that they had in, in England was they had inspections that were supposed to prevent this problem and there was a special tax but the problem was that it just became a revenue raiser essentially it was not really a regulation the the alnigers Al uh, they were called uh, the inspectors would basically just kind of give it a cursory look i'm not saying they didn't look at all but they they would look at it uh in a cursory way and collect their fee. Uh, and much more important were the middlemen uh, who the weavers often hated because they would reject uh, cloth that people had spent a long time making, uh, but they had their reputations on the line. So that was, that was one element. There were lots of things about standards. Um, they are throughout history, they tend to be enforced in what we what we might call quasi governmental ways. I mean, how do you? What is the status of a silk guild in in a city state in Renaissance Italy? Um, the, they are making the cloth. They're regulating the cloth. Uh, not just anybody can enter. And they they did. They would they would regulate things. They would require. Uh, certain type it, to indicate what type of dye you used it would be inspected and you'd have to have a certain selvage and one of the issues that came out was when cochineal which was a really great uh red dye that came from mexico where farmers had developed a way of raising these particular kinds of scale insects on on um, cactuses and it's a very very potent red dye much better than what existed in europe at the time uh, but when it first came into Europe, people was like, oh, we don't want this newfangled dye. Uh, and so they would say, well, you can't use it or you have to use this alternative way of labeling, uh, sort of like labeling GMO foods or something, uh, although it eventually took over because it was much better. But the tension that you identify in the context of flame retardants is always there uh, when you have you have a certain state of knowledge at a certain time and new people create new things or discover new things or discover new facts about what they've been doing in the past. Uh, and so the regulation can be a hindrance uh, to innovation or discovery, um, or it can just be something that people work around. 
Uh, one of the things that happened in France is when they were trying to improve the dyeing industry in response to Indian competition in particular, and they saw the Indians were really good at dyeing and, hey, we ought to get up. They tried to spread best practices, which was a good idea, except they also wanted people to innovate, which meant doing things differently. And there's an inherent tension in that. Thanks very much. Uh, uh for your question and thank you, Virginia. Um, Daivat Mehta, you're next. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Um, so one thing that I found uh, super surprising was when you talked about just the massive amount of fibers or cloth required to make uh, some of the most basic things. I think it really uh, helped create an appreciation for what a bottleneck it must have been in the manufacturing process before, of course, the Industrial Revolution. I'm curious, when I read about resources like petroleum, over time, we've gotten a lot more efficient at taking the raw resource and utilizing it as an energy source. Has that been the case when it comes to textiles? Have we become more efficient? Um, have there been technologies to improve our utilization of it? Or as it's something that we can grow, it's mainly been how we utilize it that's changed, not the um, rate at which we utilize it. Right. Well, you have to, yeah, so that's a really good question. And you sort of have to break it down to the different stages. So for example, if you're growing cotton, uh, the amount of water and uh, fertilizer, uh, and, and labor that are used today in a, in a sort of state-of-the-art American cotton farm is, you know, they're all much, much less than they would have been used in even 50 years ago, much less, you know, long ago. Um, they, the, in terms of this question and in terms of environmental impact, what interests me most today is dyeing. Uh, because dyeing is incredibly water, uh, use, it uses an incredible amount of water and it produces an incredible amount of pollution. And this did not start with the Industrial Revolution. I mean, uh, Queen Elizabeth I of England banned uh, people from doing anything with woad or indigo within a certain radius of her palaces because they it stank so much. And when I uh, went to India to do some research on dyeing and printing and and took a, a, a workshop in Kutch, which is a very deserty area, um, on traditional dyeing, I just couldn't believe with my California drought eyes how much water was just being thrown away. So even very, you know, it's not like traditional dyeing is good and nice for the environment and contemporary dyeing is bad for it. I mean, there are issues of quantity, just sheer scale. But uh, the amount, and I write about an example of this in the book, again, if you get to the frontier uh, of where people are really working hard um, to economize both to reduce environmental impact and to frankly save money, uh, save money on what they spend on energy, on water, all those things. Uh, the amounts have, the amounts that are used have gone way down in a relatively recent period. And just uh, yesterday I was reading something about a project that Ralph Lauren uh, is working on, not the person, the brand, um, is working on with uh, some of the big uh, dye manufacturing companies to even more reduce the amounts of, you know, everything that they use, including energy. Great, thank you. I think we've got time for one more question. Uh, Skylar Gunty, you had your hand up uh, before. Would you still like to ask a question? Sure. Um, my question is just um, a little bit broader. Um, so we don't learn about any of this really in our standard history classrooms. Maybe you hear about it in terms of the US economy or slavery and cotton, but, um, and it might be an impossible question, but when you think about stepping back how textiles and every form of textile and dyeing um, has influenced society and the fabric of history, what would be one piece that if you could put it into the standard history textbook that you would choose to include? 
<laughs> oh man, that's really hard. Uh, yeah. Well, you know, so I think it's safe to say that certain things, pr particularly in terms of the history of American slavery, are in there. Although the one thing that I would emphasize that I talk about in the book that I don't think people exactly get is how people who were slaves in the eastern United States, so they had already come from Africa, they'd already had that middle passage, but there was a second exile where they were driven to, against their will, to the frontier in the Mississippi Valley. And so families were broken up and, and people were just disrupted from their lives in ways that I think could have been avoidable with other policy. Um, and, and that I think it's like a second tragedy. It's, uh, um, but I would say there is a, if I were going to include something, I think I would include um, more about the, the, the incredible amount of effort and just time that women had to devote to spinning thread and how, you know, all that stuff about how much thread it takes to make anything. And so, and so that people have a context to understand the impact of the industrial revolution. And it also ripples through in women's lives. So uh, you get women working in those early spinning mills, which tend to be taught as horrible places to work, which in many cases they were, uh, but they gave a lot of particularly in the U.S., uh, girls coming off of farms, teenagers, uh, their first independent income and a sense of independence from their family. And that is also a, uh, a process that is, you know, happening today in Vietnam. Uh, so um, that's a kind of understanding that I think uh, would be worth including. But one of the Thank things you. I just just to say about the book, one of the things I really liked about writing the book, and I think I hope readers get this experience of reading the book, is you get it's a great lens because everybody uses textiles to get an appreciation of world history. And so, you know, I learned about the Mongols. I learned a lot about Chinese history. I learned some about West African history. I learned some about Indian history, uh, as well as a lot more, even though I had studied uh, some of the Renaissance in college, I learned a tremendous amount about, you know, Renaissance Italy and, and the history of, of Europe as well. Uh, thanks, Skylar, for your question, and thanks again ever so much, Virginia, for just a wonderful, uh, wonderful performance. Great to see all of you here today. Thank you for coming. Uh, Virginia, come back and visit us uh, uh, soon, and very best of luck with this absolutely fascinating-looking uh, book. It's called The Fabric of Civilization. Yes, we'll and, hold uh, it up. Yes, indeed. And it's a normal size book. It's not, uh, you know, it's not a, <laughs> it's got a lot in it, but it's not some tome. <laughs> it's, it's, not, it's not a doorstop. It's, it's an actual uh, readable book. Uh, and uh, the very best of luck to you with it. Uh, it, 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 seems like a, it seems like a great contribution. Thank bye you bye very now. much.